Good evening, good evening, good evening. Back to myth. Another night of myth making. And uh, we'll start with just one theme, a theme that we've worked on before, but I think we can present it now in a new way. Key notion, relations, are constant the terms vary everything in the universe anything you want to know is made up of either terms or relations you're either going to study particular things or you're going to study the way in which particular things relate. And that's the sum of it all. But there is something quite interesting about relations and terms that are constant. Because if we are within a hierarchical universe, right, that's what we're living in. That's the nature of our existence, a hierarchical ordered universe. Then this quite simple statement, relations are constant in terms vary, has an interesting significance for us because that means the highest order, the most significant, the most divine of all ordered systems is no different then, on the physical universe, whatever intermediary terms there may be. Because the terms will vary, the relations are constant. Now, I'd like to bring you into mythology through metaphysics and then back into mythology. So let's start. First of all, Anything in the Platonic universe starts out with the highest view of the nature of the one. Nature of the one, or the good, is the ultimate. This is well developed in Plato's Parmenides, the first hypothesis. It's that beyond which nothing can be said. This is the Dia negativa. This is the ultimate about which everything before it must remain in silence. You cannot ever predicate anything of it because it would be lessening it. Therefore, we start with the one. Now, it's very interesting. You start with the one. And the only real metaphysical question there is, which of course is the nature of the one. can take that many ways, and it's always kind of an intriguing way to jump and take it in a new way, so I have to hold back the horses because I just thought of another way of taking it. <laughs> but let's try it. Liquor. The next most fundamental thing is what is called by three names, being Vitality or power, we can use power or vitality, and intellect, or we can use another term for it, mind. Vitality. By being, we mean the highest expression of what is, the purest. Notice three terms. They can be arranged most ideally in a triangle because they function as a mean analogy. Let's put it there, all right? Being, power, intellect. Now, what is this? Look here, what is this? These are three words 
that are fundamental because there is a very profound spiritual experience of illumination. This divine luminosity, which is experienced by some people, sometimes can be regarded as divine radiance, divine luminosity, pure light, no boundaries, no boundaries, no boundaries, no up and down, permeates all, and yet it can be participated in in ever and ever more deeper levels, but it's always the same. Now, where does the Greek spirit of metaphysics enter this? And that is, what words can you assign to this? First word is, for the person, it in, they encounter something, they encounter something, which is more real than anything else they've ever experienced. It has a very vast, profound reality. Being, special word. Encountering it, you know that there can be nothing beyond it. There can be nothing higher than it. It must be the highest expression of what is and the most profound. But it's not an ordinary light. It has a vast power and vitality to it. It's not dead. It has a vast power and vitality to it. But one thing is clear, is that you are face to face with an experience that you can recognize in lesser forms and shadows as intuition. Suddenly, you're confronted with an obvious fact, and the obvious fact is, for any intuition you've ever had, that's the very same thing extended beyond limit. Therefore, it's a startling awareness. It's a startling awareness of mindfulness. It is. Therefore, the Greek said, we can understand this experience in terms of these very basic terms. And from that, we can generate everything else. That means then someone had to way back when take a look at this and say, it's not enough merely to experience it. It's worthwhile understanding it. Therefore, they had to make these distinctions. They had to make these distinctions so clear that other people could profit by it, and they could push it into other realms. And that's where we're going to, that's what we're going to do. We're going to push it into different realms. So, the one, the good, <whistles> divine luminosity expressed in these three terms. That's the primary triad, it's called. Now, Yes, yes, what yes. is the Greek for this divine luminosity? Uh, well, it's light, the word for light. Uh, what is that? Uh, Phobos, what is it? Phobos. Uh, what do you call it? Word I'm of is the, the more oh, elevated. Yeah, me too. Because in Very English, cool. people well, use. Let's see if we can get them to jump his memory. Is that yeah. the same? Well, Joe, do, do, do you have a text? Not ah, from um, uh, It'll generate. It'll generate. We'll get it. We'll get it. Okay. And thank you for the question. Now look here. 
all of Greek metaphysics is nothing other than this triangle because it takes this form. You can also, you see, talk about being, and you can say, what is the existence of being? What is the power of being? What is the mind of pure being? You can equally talk about it this way. You can say if there is a power and a vitality, you can say, wait a minute, this vitality isn't mindless? Oh no, see, it has mindfulness, it's mind. So there is a great power, but you can also talk about it, the power, the uh, mind of that power, the intellect of that power, the power of that power. And by the way, when you do that, the power of that power is the Greek word for that which always is, that's eternity. You can also take this. You can take the intellect and say, wait a minute, can you talk about the uh, intellect? Can you talk about the existence of that intellect? Yeah. Can you talk about that power of that intellect? Can you talk about the highest expression of that intellect? That means, therefore, for each one of these, you can then break it out, break it out, as it were, and create another tyrant, triad, and so on. So, we can also, therefore, talk about here, right, that's this corner, I'm just pulling it down, we can talk about what is the existence, the existence of mind. We're talking about what's the power of mind or the vitality of mind. You know, what's the highest expression of, you see, we can also talk about this, see, as the, this is another word for activity or function, right? So we can say, what is the activity? What's the activity of mind in its highest expression? So we can have three words. We can talk about existence. We can talk about power. We can talk about activity. These are the three major words we need. Because the activity of pure being is mind. Now, when you talk about the existence of mind, you can personify it. You can make it into a person. You can represent it in a figure. Kronos. 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 That's Kronos. You can have a lot of fun with that. You can talk about the power of the mind, Rhea. You can talk about the activity of mind, Zeus. You know what would be interesting to see? See, we can break this down further. We can take the activity of mind, can we not? We can take the activity of mind, can we not? And break that into three others, right? Same as we did before. Now, it's the special function, it's the special function of Kronos, which is the existence of mind, to illuminate, to illuminate this entire realm. That's what it does, it illuminates the entire realm. And in that sense, through that illumination, what is it? Why, it's a vast power, of course, it's power. It has mind, it has vitality, it has existence. If it has these qualities, then it can perfect. This is a perfecting power. It is a perfecting luminosity. 
It fills everything. Right? It distributes itself everywhere and appropriately extends itself in a measured way, not random, in a measured way. You put all those things together, that's called adrastia or destiny. That's destiny. So that's destiny. That's what they mean by destiny. Wow, that's interesting. Now look here. Let's see if we can go one more step. What do we mean by this thing? Soul. We're taking it in the basic sense that we say there is something within, let's take man first, there's something in man which plans you had to have a plan to come here. You had to then command yourself to carry out those plans. And you only did that because you have a primary care for yourself and you seek to benefit yourself. What is it in man that does those things? Soul. That's the Greek, Greek, that's the Greek word for soul. That's what they mean. Just that. Notice it presupposes, soul presupposes, soul presupposes the existence of and then a dependence upon mind. Because you can't plan and command and seek for your own care unless you've got a mind. Right? You can't make up a plan, can't follow it through, and can't pursue it for your own care and benefit unless you have some mindfulness about you. Would you not agree you can't do that unless there's some spirited part of your nature? Not spiritual, but spirited, energy, right? Power. Right. Now, in the Greek world, the entire universe, the entire universe, in the activity of Zeus, he is the creator. This is Zeus the creator. We can use the word Zeus in several ways. They're called Zeus the first, Zeus the second. Zeus the creator, in creating the universe, had to have an idea, a model, a paradigm. Therefore, in creating the universe, he had to have a mind to create it. He had to have a power and a skill to employ it. And therefore, he had to have some activity to do it. There we have our triad again. In the creation of the universe, he had to create, before he created the universe, since in the universe, would you not agree, there's evidence that the universe has been planned, there's enough design features to say that there is a command, right? I mean, that there are plans organized. Therefore, in order for the universe to exist as it did, it had to be ordered, and the order is now inherent within this universe of ours. Well, you can't have intelligence going around by itself. It always needs soul within which it functions. Therefore, the universe as a whole has soul, which then presupposes mind. Now, what, now see, any time you do this, you have to consider something curious that, that, that is behind all metaphysics. Source of something, the source of something. The order it has, the purpose for which it came into existence. Therefore, if there is soul throughout the universe, there must be something, there must be something that supervises it, that's in charge of it, that's responsible for it. Another word for those things. It has to be a prior condition for it. And that we can assign 
a hierarchical source to it. So you look, let's do it again. All right? If the universe can be said to have soul because it appears to be ordered, then there must be something that was its source. There must be some source of its order. There must be some purpose for its existence, and therefore there must be something supervising it. Something over it, reigning over it. So let me represent that in this way. There must be something over the soul that in some way ensures that it functions the way it does. Therefore, if this is mind, that presupposes that there must be something over mind. And that usually, metaphorically and metaphysically, is called Uranus, heaven. Now, once you have, therefore, this mindfulness, it needs a repository, soul. And if you have soul, then you need something in charge of soul. Well, you need something else, too, because if you have world soul, this soul, world soul, must somehow become fragmented so that you and I can get a piece of it. it must be separated from the whole. And if it's separated from the whole, then whatever it does, there may be a return to it, to its source. Well, there's a separation and, so and return. Then we can go back to our model and we can say one of the functions of the activity in any one of these triads we're creating and playing with, we can say, its activity is twofold. It can go to the next level, the next level, but it also can return to its source. Each one of these then can return to its source in a hierarchy. Now, how are you going to represent this world soul, because it must mean it, it extends itself throughout the universe. Well, all right, look here. All we need to do is get another triangle. That's all we need, another triangle. Zeus, Zeus is the source of it, therefore we'll call him the father, all right? Zeus, then, is the father of the next order of existence. And that's going to have to be soul in general. Because that was mind in general. Now we're going to have soul in general. Well, if he's the father, well, um, Each one, every source, every source can be called a father. Every term that's generated from it can be called its children. Every father can be given a name, and the children can be given names, and therefore we personify it. So, what is this soul that then is going to reign? Well, Zeus is going to reign over the soul, but now we're going to have another term for Zeus, sometimes called Zeus the second. And then we're going to have his brother, Poseidon, and his brother Pluto. They're all brothers. They're all brothers. Now, 
What happens, therefore, when the soul then, general soul, as we said a moment ago, fragments and separates itself, then we need another order, don't we? We need another order. Okay, that's easy to do. I'll go back to this in a moment. When the general soul takes on a particular entity, takes on a separation from the soul, then we can make another triad to express it. Because now there are going to be a whole bunch of souls throughout, and they're going to have to be supervised and ruled. Well, that's soul in general, and now we're going to have a distribution of other souls, a bunch of them now, all right, a whole bunch of souls. This is soul in general. All right, a whole bunch of souls. You know what we can do? We can give them new names. But remember what we said a moment ago, father and children. Well, now we can get into mythology. You see, when Zeus saw the beauty of Europa, He seduced her, of course, and out came, as the child, Minos. And his brother was Radamanthus. Zeus also had an affair with Aegina. And lo and behold, the child was named A-E-A-E-U-S. They are all the children of Zeus, next level. So pictorially, next level, children, father, father, children, all the way up. So let's just quickly go back once more. Ultimate term, the one, there is this experience and represented metaphysically in this way, which we're calling divine luminosity. Necessarily, we are confronted with the fact that one, one aspect of it that we can talk about is intellect or mind. We can then look at mind and talk about it in three ways. We can say mind itself has an existence. Mind itself has a power. There's also an activity of mind. Now each one of these have personified names which represent each of the gods, that represent the qualities of each of these, which we could go into, but let's hold it for a moment. Right. And Kronos is the very source of the illumination of this entire region. Therefore, we can then say, we would like to now see on the next level right, Zeus as the activity of mind functions in itself. Ah, another tirade, tirade, pardon me, triad that comes down from that. As this came down to this, well, then that's the family of Zeus and his brothers. And that's usually described as the terms you need to understand soul in general. Because these are the three views of Zeus, by the way. Zeus for the upper world and divine souls. He represents divine souls. And those that are elevated. And Poseidon is considered to be um, uh, those that are mid. Right? And Pluto, those that are in the lower. This is also called marine Zeus in Greek mythology, the marine Zeus, because Poseidon is responsible for all the lower, level, the lower levels of our world, uh, the valleys, the rivers, the waters. He's the marine Zeus. And Pluto, of course, as you know, is the subterranean world, the um, world dealing with all of the earthquakes, all of the forces beneath the world. For each of these, there can be said to be a domain responsible to each of these people. 
and therefore this is sometimes sacred to ha of Plato, Pluto to Hades, Poseidon to the seas, Zeus to the divine souls in the heavens. In the same way, Zeus is uh, considered to be uppermost in the heavens, and therefore the fixed stars are his domain. Uh, Poseidon the sun, and Pluto the moon, and other attributes akin to these follow. Now, we want to go further. We want to see what happens when you take this idea of soul in general and what happens when you break it through and talk about soul as it takes on an intelligible status and an entity in itself. There has to be a separation and a new realm. And how is it represented? It's represented, therefore, for the journey of the soul in this world. So the journey of the soul throughout throughout those regions we just described can now be represented in terms of these three figures. And again, there are going to be three different periods that we can look at, and therefore we'll do that, and I think now we can go into the myth. Right? Good. Just for you, I just want to say, the structure you've drawn in modern mathematics is known fractals. Fractals. Yes. Yeah, fractals, exactly. repeating the same figure. Exactly. That's right, yes. the fractals, right. And there also is a mean analogy, you see, because, yeah. right, A is to B as B is to C. You can represent that, A is to B, A is to B as B is to C. And that's the leading metaphysical idea for reading uh, Plotinus, Plato, and Proclus. Yes, thank you, that was a nice thought. Right. Okay. Let's see now. See whether our excursion can help us. Uh, good, we've got plenty of time. All right, one, two, three, four, five pages. I want you to take everything I shall say as strict truth. That's the way Plato introduces them. Up. I'm at 523 in the Gorgias. When, as Homer says, Zeus, Poseidon, and Pluto took over the rule of the universe, well, let's turn it back. When they took over the rule of the universe from their father, they divided it among themselves. Three periods of time, The first age is called the age of Kronos. The second is called the age of Kronos with the beginning of Zeus. And the third is the reformed Zeus, three areas. Now in the time of Kronos, there was a law concerning mankind. Um, that's often called destiny, which holds to this very day among the gods that any man who's passed his life in a just and holy fashion should upon his death and in the islands of the blessed, and dwell there in complete happiness out of the reach of evil. While the doer of evil, impious, and there's, you know, doer of evil and impious deeds should be sent to the prison house of retribution and judgment, Tartarus. Only two, two extremes, no third. No third, see, one or the other. Now in the time of Kronos and the earlier portion of Zeus's reign, the judges were living men. Mm. Well, if they're living men, then they judged their fellows while they were still alive. And since the arraignment of a man was held on the day that he was about to die, for this reason, the judgment was conducted badly. So Pluto was upset because no one's going to Hades. Well, the wrong people are going to Hades. Well, the wrong people are going to the islands of the blessed. So both Pluto and the overseers of the islands of the blessed came to Zeus and reported that improper persons were being sent to both places. 
Then Zhu said, I'll have to put a stop to this proceeding. It's quite true that the judgments are now conducted badly, but the defendants are brought to trial clothed and the judgment is passed while they're still alive. There are many, he said, who have wicked souls, but are clad in beautiful clothes, beautiful bodies, and the pride of race and wealth. And when judgment comes, many witnesses advance to their aid, testifying to the justice of their lives. The judges are overawed by these. Furthermore, they themselves are clothed with the veil of eyes and ears. And indeed, the whole body interposed before their souls as they sit in judgment. So they're judging through the senses and through their values. And this becomes an obstacle for them. Both their own clothing and that of those they judge. Now first, Zhu said, we must terminate the following thing, six. We must terminate men's knowledge of death. I've given orders to Prometheus to make sure that this rule is carried out. Next, they must all be judged in nakedness, for judgment must be passed, and only be passed after they're dead. The judge, almost, the judge must also be uh, naked and dead in order that the judgment shall be just. Is very contemplating the naked soul of each man who has died without warning, bereft of all his kin and all his trappings left behind upon the earth. Accordingly, since I reckon this state of affairs even before the rest of you, I have appointed my own sons, two from Asia, Minos, huh? Minos, pardon me, Minos, Radimathus, and Aeus. I've appointed my own sons to be judges, two of them from Asia, Minos and Radimathus, and one from Europe. By the way, these two are from Asia. Asia means, in the Greek mythology, the area of light. West is in darkness as the sun sets in the west, therefore it's darkness. The east, therefore, Plato is saying, the, this is the realm of light, this is the realm of darkness. Of these, when they're dead, they shall give judgment in the meadow at the crossroads from which the true roads lead, one to the islands of the blessed, the other to Tartarus. And Radimanthus should judge those from Asia, Achaeus those from Europe, and Minos, whenever they have any doubts, it will be decided by Minos, the mean. He will judge. He will therefore have more mind. Being more mindful, he should be therefore at the top of, the, uh, top of our triangle, for that's the position of mind in every case, existence of mind. And so, wait a minute, um, there's another possibility of putting minnows here. So the question is whether or not, just formally, whether or not you're talking about the existence of mind, then it's here, or you're talking about the functioning of mind here between these two. But these two have to be opposites, extremes. And, the, the, um, and that's the way that's settled. You have to have the opposites, the one in, this, in the, the mean. Okay, let me go back to that, because there's two ways you can represent that. Um, I shall give the prerogative of passing sentence on appeal when the other two have any doubts, and so the judgment of a man's last journey shall be rendered with the utmost justice. Now, what's the judgment? What are these judgments that are going to be made, whether they make them or whether when in doubt Minos makes them. Now, he has now a very interesting analogy, right? and what he's going to do is talk about the effect that life has on the body, and the relations are going to be similar on the soul. So therefore, he's going to use terms for the one and pass them over to the second. Let's see how he does it. This Callicles is what I have heard and I believe to be true, and from this narrative I draw some such inference as this. Death, as I think, turns out to be merely a divorce of two things, the soul from the body. And when they have separated one from each other, 
right? Each of them still retains much the same condition as it had while the man was living. The body retains its natural contours, see? The body, watch now, retains the natural contours with the marks of its upbringing and its experiences quite manifest. The marks, that's the key term which we need for our next exploration. The body, every effect that you have, of course, imprints on the body, but it also imprints on the soul. He's then going to use these terms, which are appropriate in the physical realm, but he's going to find parallels functioning on another level for the level of the soul. Let's see how he does it. For example, if a man's body was quite large when he was alive, either naturally or the result of diet, or both, when he escaped, when he dies, his corpse will be large. If it was fat, the corpse will be fat, and so on. If he has long hair, the corpse will have long hair. If he's used to, uh, to be beaten and have the marks and scars and lashes or blows and other wounds of his body while alive, these may be still seen on the body when he's dead. Or if he had any limbs broken or distorted during life and death, they, these same are going to be plainly visible. Here comes his principle. In a word, whatever characteristics a, a man's body presented in life, these remain visible in death, either all of them or most of them for some time, for some time, some little time. Next up. Now the same state of appear, affair, uh, pardon me. Now the same state of affairs appears to me to hold true for the soul. Now we're going on the level of soul. When it has been stripped of the body, everything in it becomes visible. All its natural traits, as well as those acquired from every habit and every pursuit. Therefore, we have the imprint on our soul of every habit and every pursuit we've ever gotten engaged in. Therefore, all kinds of learning, all kinds of experiences are going to be visible to the, on the soul. When, therefore, the dead appear before the judge, those from Asia before Radimathus, he causes them to halt before him and examine each soul with no knowledge of its identity. Often, indeed, he has laid hold of, of, on the king of Persia or some other monarch or despot and discern nothing sound in the soul, for it's deeply scarred by the whip and full of festering wounds brought on by perjury and crime. These now are going to be the marks on the soul, and these are going to be the kinds of things that have produced them. For it is deeply scarred by the whip and full of festering wounds brought on by perjury and crime. The imprint on the soul of its very and every act. It sees all of it twisted by lies and imposture. Crooked, because it has received no nourishment of truth. It sees in compact or of distortion and hideousness by reason of irresponsibility and licentiousness. And when he has seen such a soul, he sends it in all dishonor straight off to the prison where it's destined to enter and undergo the sufferings that are its due. Now, now we're going to get a mean. See, before we only had those two realms. It was either Tartarus, it was either Tartarus, or the Blessed Islands. Now we're going to get the mid-region where it is possible for the soul to be sent and yet return. Everyone who is punished and, pun and rightly punished either ought to be benefited or become better or serve as an example to others that they may behold these sufferings and through fear become better. Those that are benefited by their punishment at the hands of men and gods are they that have committed only curable sins. The curable return the incurable stay. Nonetheless, their improvement must come through the pangs of suffering, both here and in Hades. Only in this way can they be rid of their wrongdoing. But those who have committed the extreme of injustice, incurable, they serve an example to others. They benefit 
not at all, since they're incurable. Yet others may do so when they observe these mal malefactors suffering in the greatest and most painful and the most fearful torments because of their sins, strung up forever in the prison house of Hades as a portent, a warning to the unjust as they arrive below. And one of these, I say, is uh, Archelaus. If Polis tells uh, about him is true, or any other tyrant who resembles him, and now he makes his claim about the nature of the incurable. If you have, if power, if authority and power, position authority and power, tyrant, invariably incurable. Yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, this political power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I'll put it in. Is this political power abuse of political power? Because yeah. if a philosopher yes. king yes. would be. That's absolutely right. He said it can go in two ways. For him, nearly everyone goes this way, and very few ever can endure that kind of power and authority without committing some injustice. It's this very rare. Therefore, his suggestion is avoid power entirely. Avoid politics. It is Callicles from the ranks of the powerful that the supremely wicked are drawn. Yet there's nothing to prevent a good man from being found in this class also. And they, when they occur, are entirely admirable, for it is both difficult and most praiseworthy, Callicles, to live a just life when one has the greatest opportunities to do wrong. And I'm going to skip a bit. And so, as I was saying, the mighty Radimathus receives such a man, knowing nothing else about him, neither name nor lineage, but only that he is bad. And on perceiving this, he packs him off to Tartarus, putting a mark upon him to indicate whether he seems curable or not. And the criminal proceeds to prison and suffers whatever is due. On occasion, the judge may perceive a soul that has lived in holiness and truth, a soul of some private person or another. But most often, Callicles, as I should say, it will be the soul of the philosopher is kept to his own business and is not meddled with others' affairs during his lifetime. Wherefore, whereupon, the judge is struck with admiration and sends him to the isles of the blessed. Achaeus' role is just the same. Each of them sits in judgment. While, Minos, while Minos, the overseer, sits apart, he alone has a golden scepter. Just as Homer's Odysseus says, he saw him holding a scepter of gold and, and judging among the dead. So, Callicles, I've been convinced by these accounts. It has become my concern now and I may present to the judge my soul in its healthiest condition. And insofar as I, I'm just, just, just skipping a, a line or two, and insofar as I am able, I will urge all other men to such a life and such a contest as this, which I affirm to be worth all the contest here on earth put together. And I retort to your reproaches that it is you who will be unable to help yourself when the trial and that judgment which I have just described comes upon you. You will have to appear before the judge, a genius son, a genius son as we know, is our good friend. Aeus, that's Aegeus's son, because he's in the west, and I suspect it's also because it's dark, but that's my own little ad line. When he lays hands upon you and drags you before him, it is you who will stand there with gaping mouth and reeling head no less than I am here, and it will be you, perhaps, 
whom they will shamefully slap in the face and mistreat you with every indignity. Now, it's quite possible that all this may seem to you to be a myth, an old wives' tale. You'll despise it. Nor would, you, uh, uh, nor would your contempt be surprising if with all, your, with, with all our, our searching we could find anything better or truer than this account. But as it is, you will observe that the three of you, the wisest of all the Greeks alive at this moment, you and Polus and Gorgias, are unable to demonstrate the necessity of living any other life than this, which clearly brings advantage after death as well. And that's another paragraph, and that's how he ends, isn't it? Now, I want to go back to the opening line of the myth. Then listen, as they say to this very fine tale, which you may consider a myth, but I regard as a true story, for I want, to for I want you to take everything I shall say as strict truth. If he takes everything as strict truth, then going back up with all of the references he has made, because we have to find these connections, they knew them, I'm just filling them in, this was known, this mythology was known, therefore what is it that's true? that there's a metaphysics behind it. And what can you see behind it? Nothing other than one principal triangular model that runs through the entire thing. For relations are constant, though the terms for each may change. And what does he do with mythology? He brings it down to the level where he wants to discuss some problem, find what's parallel to it in this map, personify it with certain people, bring them in in terms of the family relationships that already exist in the mythology, match it with his metaphysics, or metaphysics matches the mythology, or the mythology match matches the metaphysics, which either way you want, so that you have a perfect unity between the two. Thank you, that's what I wanted to play with. Are well known, the islands of the blessed and Tartarus. Well, yeah. you see, he only had these two. He didn't have any return. There's no mention of any return in the time of Zeus during the, pardon me, during the reign of Kronos. This is the reign of Kronos. Okay. This is the reign of Kronos with the beginning reign of Zeus. It failed because the wrong people were going to the wrong places. Because they were, they were judged while they were still alive and while they were dressed. That's right, and the judges themselves were alive. So he changes that, right? He says, this can no longer endure. We need this new water. And with this new water, therefore, we get a new element, and that is we also get a return. We didn't have a return before. All we had is the islands of the blessed and Tartarus. No mention of any return, no understanding what was going on in that realm. So is the return the, the third group of people or a group of souls, I should say? That's right. The is curable. Do you go down and take a look and then come back? Or? Uh, uh, I'm not sure I have your question. Want to try it again? <coughs> do, the judges, do the judges now in the myth in the third section now judge the soul? after it's died yes. and they are dead, and now they not only can judge that the soul could go to the Isles of the Blessed or to Tartarus, but that it could go third place. That's right. Be, what, to go to Tartarus and take a look around and come back? Do they stay Well, after they, after they pay off their whatever it is they owe. Because I don't remember seeing that in this myth clearly. On other myths I have. Uh, what part, don't you say? That, where, where the third choice is offered. Well, the third choice is, is offered between the curable and the incurable. The curable are cured of their, of their uh, punishment, oh, okay. and therefore they can return. And then they can return. Then they can return. So between the two extremes, to the curable, he has a return. You have to have, you have, to have a return, because now we have Isles of the Blessed, 
right? And now we have the two regions of Hades, right? The incurable and the curable. Here the curable, and the curable can return. Not to the islands of bliss, but they can return for the, a new existence and the possibility of getting there. But this myth does not tell you how you're cured? Or does it? Because I don't see that no. here. It's in other... other. No. This, this myth says nothing about this journey. It says nothing about this. It says nothing about the Isles of the Blessed. In the Phaedo, we remember we got a good deal about the dynamics of the <coughs> underworld. Here we get the judgment of the underworld in those two classes, but we don't get any insight into this realm. Or how, or how to be cured, or how to get there from that's, that's right. the middle. That's right. Okay. That's right. There's no way of, equally, there's no way of understanding what brings people so this all this allows is a, I better not use that model. Let me use a new one because it already exists for another purpose. Uh, I'll, this is what we're going to call this the Isles of the Blessed. Hades are Tartarus. Oh, this here. And here, you just get, from here to here, you find out what's going on. You find out what brought people here. You don't, you don't find out anything about this passage, nor do you discover any geography of that, or any of description of the journey of the soul here. That's left out. What you do get is that there are two parts in this land of Tartarus and how the judgments are being made, essentially. That's what you're getting. In the Phaedo, you're getting the, the struggles of those who have already been judged. In the Phaedo, you don't get any judgment. That, that is to say, you don't understand how the judgments are being made. In the Gorgias, you do. In the Phaedo, you see the journey into the other world, into Tartarus and the other rivers. Yeah. You mentioned uh, the Phaedo. Let me throw out two other dialogues and then ask you a question about them. The myth of the Republic and in the faith of the various status uh, that the soul can reach. <coughs> would it be fair to, you know, could you compose a, a mythology of death and rebirth in, in Plato by combining yes. mm -hmm. the Gorgias? the myth of her and the Phaedrus, and then you can work out all the different, it seems like you can work yeah. out all these questions. That's right. And is that a fair? Yeah. And the Phaedrus. That's where we're going. And the Phaedrus. Yeah. That's Very right. Good. I think what would be really splendid, as I, I hope one day someone will do, is to get a mural or a CD-ROM where you can link them all together, link them all together. Yeah. Like they have, yeah, stack them. Mm -hmm. Now, when you do that, does it mention where is the source of the soul? Because we're used to the fact, since we live on this earth, yes. we're used to start the starting point being on earth, but it seems as improbable that that is a starting point. Do you mean source as the origin of it? That's the Plato's time is. That's the time is. And um, see, in the realm of the soul, see, on each level, there are primary <coughs> ideas associated with each level, controlling ideas for each level. On the level of the soul, there is similarity and dissimilarity. And similarity and dissimilarity presuppose a prior, in order to talk about similarity and dissimilarity, that presupposes that you can talk about identity, identity and difference or otherness. Or sometimes they talk about it as same, same and otherness, or 
that any one of these words will do. It presupposes it. Um, the basic kind of thinking that man has to learn must deal with similarity and dissimilarity. Because with that, then, you can appreciate the idea of same and difference. And if you go from same and difference, that means you can then go into unity and finally one. Each one of these has their own metaphysics. Each one has their own domain. And each one, as it were, can be expressed with these, these basic ideas. The basic notion of similarity and dissimilarity in the Platonic world, or any world, I guess, uh, It presupposes relations and terms. When you have when you have terms in the same class, if you have terms in the same class being related to terms in um, similar class, right? Well, let me, let me make this even better. You can have an order of ideas. Let's take them. Uh, a shepherd is to a sheep. They are in the same class, the class of husbandry or caring is to a captain and his crew or a physician and his patients. The relationships between a shepherd and his sheep are going to be care, guide, protect, watch over, care, protect, Watch over. Now watch how you need the word similar. Do you want to say a captain relates to his crew and a physician relates to patients? Must they not both care for their crew? Physician cares for his patients? Don't you want to say they must protect them, watch over them, be concerned with them in the same way or a similar way? must be similar, agree? Otherwise, uh, the captain would take his crew up to the mountains to eat grass, which is against the FDA, right? <laughs> right, is that, is that? They don't want the crew going up there and eating grass on mountaintops. Okay, and it would be ludicrous, wouldn't it? Then the captain would take off, would bring, would probably use a dog to keep his crew in line while he would climb mountains to look for lush meadows. So it's not same, it's similar. So as we appreciate similarity and difference, that's the realm of analogy, that's the realm of mathematics, that's the realm of abstract thought, similarity and difference, because it presupposes same. Notice what it presupposes. Shepherd and sheep, they belong in the same class. Captains and crew belong in the same class. We can say they belong in the same class. There's one class then, one, and this is one. But yet even though they are in similar classes, there must be a dissimilarity between them. Therefore, the primary terms for using the mind for mankind is to come to grips with functioning with similarity, dissimilarity, that then brings them to understand and appreciate the role of same and other, or same and difference, which you can then raise to the question of the unity of these ideas, and behind the idea of unity presupposes the idea of one. Each one of these realms of ideas is appropriate to each one of these realms, which can be represented mythically, metaphysically, either way, in analogical formations. 
So I hope that I, I, I didn't take it too often. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Thank you. Good. Okay, I'll bite. Go ahead. In the beginning of the talk, you said there was another way of taking the one that you thought of. <laughs> was that... Is that fair to do now, or...? Well, I was looking at this. <laughs> that, um, maybe it's even pictorially. You know, I think maybe even to be pictorially, you might be able to do as a, an artist might be able to arrange it. But, um, <laughs> then experienced highest experience, then uh, see that would be coming forward, right? And then another one in terms of what we were doing, mind, and then be on another, another page, right? Soul in general, particular souls, right? and just represented as, as separate plastic sheets, as it were, being superimposed. And then you might be able then to work out the mythology for each one and the language for each one, the metaphysics for each one on separate sheets, and that would be a nice way to represent it. But I didn't think of that before. But you know, then you could go in and out, and you could see, therefore, there's an intimate connection between Greek mythology and metaphysics, and the pictorial way in which they represent it, and all the images associated with them, right? You could play back and forth through that. This would be perfect for the CD-ROM. This representation would be perfect for the CD-ROM. Yeah, yeah, wouldn't it? Yeah, do it. <laughs> you can start with fractals. After October, you're free, I hear. Yes, yes, with your fractal. That is fractals, isn't it? It is. Yeah. That's right, because the further you go, the same image reappears. <coughs> and by the way, you can do each one of these in, uh, in this, uh, this realm, you can do the same thing again, going this way. Uh-huh, uh-huh, yellow doesn't show. In Procol, this is really Proculus's work. You can then talk about it this way as well. That is to say, you can talk about existence as being, then you can talk about the mind, remember what we are doing before? You can talk about the, the mind of existence, right? You can talk about the power of, it, of being. You can talk about the activity of being, which is really another, and so on. With each of these, you can then break out. And therefore, it's well ordered. You can pull it out. And it'll probably break somewhere, but in the, for the good part of it, it should remain. Because sometimes models doesn't, you know, don't represent totally a theoretical system, but I think it would represent a large percentage of them. What I'm thinking of in terms of computers, in fact, this would be one of the biggest problems in uh, artificial intelligence is natural language processing. Yeah. Which they have never managed to That's sort right. out That's because right. computer has to yeah. understand the story. Yeah. It can't just understand the syntax, mm -hmm. etc. You know, in 956, they yeah, thought yeah. they're going to solve That's natural right. language processing by 58, and they still mm -hmm. haven't. And using this analogy, yeah. maybe a clue yeah. of... Oh, I do it myself. I think the analogy is the key to all of us because uh, it makes everything clear. clear. But uh, equally well, uh, there's a special language and importance on certain concepts, as you just said as well. Mm -hmm. And that you can be, someone can be brought into a different dialogues so that they can then appreciate these levels of ideas as they become more familiar. They gain greater access to the very thing that's significant to the system. Yeah. Yeah.
A lot of fun. Good. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.